بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم الصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله واللاتي تخافون نشوزهن فعظوهن وهجروهن في المضاجع واضربوهن فإن أطعنكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا إن الله كان عليا كبيرا وإن خفتم شقاق بينهما فبعثوا حكما من أهله وحكما من أهلها إن يريد إصلاحا يوفق الله بينهما إن الله كان عليما خبيرا صدق الله العظيم We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, there's a few things we want to discuss here today One is the the status of women in Islam, the status that they have in contrast with their status uh, within the Europeans and the Americans and what status they've offered. That's one issue today here. Uh, the second issue is going to be about the difference, the differences between the, the rights that men have over women and women have over men. So, hukuku zawjiyya, or the rights of, men, of, of uh, husbands and wives. To begin with, in, in Europe and in the West, a lot of us have heard of the movement of, of, the, of, of feminism, and women have, for, a couple of, for the last few centuries, couple of centuries within Europe and America, they have made movements and even they've gone on hun- hunger strikes, they've, they've lost their lives in this cause in order to get their rights. Now this movement has started mainly around, it started mainly around the growth of the industrial, industrial revolution and why it started in Europe and America is that women were seen as the subordinates in the society. They did not have equality with men. They were living lives where they were struggling with themselves. They were, they were the women who, who would stay at home. Many of them were deprived of ed- education. Some of them even just in the early 1900s received education through the state, whereas before that they would have, have to struggle for their own education. Um, they were... They were going through domestic tyranny where men would oppress them, beat them, uh, they, ha- they were denied of political rights, of uh, e- equality at work. Their husbands were the breadwinners and they were the ones who would look after everything of the house. Um, women, there were no women doctors, there were no women nurses. Right up to the 1700s in Europe, including France and England, women were fighting for, for equality in law. America, in America with the uh, slave trade and what happened through that whole history that gave rise to women, white women as well as black women who came out to protest against the tyranny that they faced from men in the society. Now with the Industrial Revolution and with, the, with World War I and then with World War II men lost a lot of their, their positions because they had to go to war or they had to flee to the cities. Because of this, this created new jobs for women, especially in the war. Women were given men's jobs of uh, looking after machinery and so on, looking after the factories behind them, even supplying for them for the, for the war, actual war. Now, when the war ended, men came back to the cities and now women once again were deprived of the jobs that they could do Uh, at one time. So, in Britain there was a male-dominated Victorian society. Women did not have any right to vote and then you had the whole movement of women 
as known as the suffrages in Britain, in India, Japan, Indonesia, China, Australia and so on, just to name a few of the countries uh, that had this. Now, many of you might have known about this whole, whole uh, movement, but what I want to focus on is the reasons why. And these were the reasons why this happened. And it was oppression of men that led to women uh, setting up this movement. Now in Islam, Alhamdulillah, we haven't had such a problem. And I will come to that uh, just in a little moment. I just want to just point, pinpoint on just a few more things that, that have taken place within the societies. This is going far beyond now, beyond uh, the Industrial Revolution. In during Roman civilization, women were regarded as slaves. The Greeks considered her as a commodity to be bought and sold. In India, the Hindus up to recently, they've had this custom where when a husband dies, the woman will, will have to die with her husband in the fire and burn together, uh, being cremated with her husband. In pre-Islamic state of Arabia, women were regarded as the very cause of the grief to the society. Therefore, children, girls, little girls were buried alive and that's in the Holy Quran. In France, in 587 uh, Christian era, this was just about the time when, when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was was uh, after he was born. That in France there was a meeting held to study the status of women and to determine whether a woman could truly be considered as a human being or not. Henry VIII in England forbade the reading of the Bible by women. And throughout the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church treated women as second-class citizens. The universities of Cambridge and Oxford did not give male and female students the same right until 1964. So that's just, just about 40 years ago, when there were equal rights in the most renowned universities in this country. Before 1850, women were not counted as citizens in England and English women had no personal rights until 1882. So we're just talking about just over a century that they got their rights. In the US, women couldn't make wills. They couldn't vote. They couldn't get jobs. They couldn't own a property. They had no equality in education. Even now, women aren't being, the, being paid the same as men. In the early 1900s, Women and men in the same company, women were getting 25% of the pay that men were receiving in the same country for the same job, for the same hours. Now it's moved up to about 75%, but there still is a struggle in the world for women getting their rights. 1972, in the United States of America, the states passed the law for equality of women in jobs. Just in 1972, that's about 30 years ago. That this happened. Now, in Islam, there's been a total different attitude towards women and their rights. And we've got to, we've got to make sure that we, when we come across non-Muslims picking on Islamic issues, they say, well, Muslim men are the ones who keep their women at home. They are the ones who beat their wives, according to the Quran. We'll come to that later on. Muslim men are the ones who deprive their women of education and so on. When they say this to us, before we become defensive and give our answers from the Qur'an, from the Sunnah, the first thing we should do is point out all, all of these things. The first thing we should do is say, well, talk about your own society, where, for instance, in America, up till today, there's never been a woman who's, who's been a president. Up till today. In England, there's only one example of that in the government, Margaret Thatcher, and even uh, Queen Elizabeth I, when she came to reign, there was a, it, it was something which they had to abandon religion to get a woman in position and in power. Whereas in, in the Islamic era, though we have a hadith that the Prophet has said, uh, he, has, for, he, he has shown disapproval of a woman uh, being head of state, but in our Islamic history, we've always had women being judges in courts. We've had in our history, women being educationists. We have, we've had in our history Arwa bint Ahmed, who was a governor of Yemen under the Fatimid Khalifa, 
end of the 5th century and beginning of the 6th century. This was in Yemen. So we've, we've had women in authority. And what, in, what the hadith refers to is an overall uh, woman who's in, who's in authority as a khalif. That we don't believe that the, that the woman has the role of imam, that the woman has the role of being in charge of the Khilafah empire. But nevertheless, I just want to go through a few points of Islam, what Islam has given to women as rights. And this came though the Arabs had a total different way of treating women. Umar radiallahu anhu would become, you know, he, when he was in Medina and he saw how much rights the Prophet was given to, to the women, sometimes he would, he would turn to the women and say, it was only yesterday that you women for a sin, you would be taken on a donkey, you would be placed on a donkey facing backwards without your clothes and made to, walk, made to be ridden around the whole city because of the sin that you committed in the society in Mecca and now you come in Medina and now you raise your voices in front of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ would tell Umar radiallahu anhu again and again Da'ahunna ya Umar Leave them alone, O Umar Leave them, O Umar So the Prophet ﷺ now was, was changing the entire structure of the whole peninsula, peninsula of, of Arabia he was changing the whole structure because these men used to beat their women in the Arabian, in Arabian uh, the civilization before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, just as the Europeans used to do it, just as the Americans used to do it, there was no law for women before uh, our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came. There was hardly any law found in any country before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came. They used to beat their women, they used to lash them with whips, they used to sometimes, if they wanted to, they would marry up to ten women at a time. There was one Sahabi who had ten women when the ayahs came down to reduce it to four. And the Prophet ﷺ then, even then, he stressed on uh, equality with women. And that, that, that Sahabi had to divorce six of them and leave four for his wives. But you can see to what extent these men went to. How they treated women. Women had no say in any uh, position of authority. They could not come to the meetings where men held their meetings, how to run the society. This was pre uh, uh, this, this is Arabia before the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But when he came, look at the rights he gave. Look at the rights he gave to women. She then now had the right to have her own education. Aisha radiallahu anha is regarded as sab'a min al min fuqaha in Medina. She is regarded as the, one of the seven faqis of jurists of Medina. His own beloved wife. After his death, she became the teacher of more than, you could say, thousands of Sahabi men. She was their teacher. She was not only a student of Islam, she was an educationist. She would stay in the Hujra of the Prophet and she would teach from there. She would teach uh, men a hadith that were, you know, of, of things that, that men could not uh, get from different riwayas, from different men, different traditions, because she, she used to live with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she reported more than 2,000 ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was just the beginning. If you look at Hafsa radiallahu anha, another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she again was another woman uh, of many virtues, and she was an educationist. She was one who would propagate hadith. If you look at um, Aisha radiallahu anha, I mean, today we've got a problem in certain countries, they will not allow women to even drive. And look at the Prophet's statement in Bukhari. He says, Khayru nisa'i Quraysh, rakibna al-ibl. This is in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. The best of the Qurayshi women are those who have, who have ridden camels. They ride camels. They are the best of Qurayshi women. He encouraged women to go to, he gave them the rights to, to, to ride camels. If you look at Aisha radiallahu anha in a particular time after the Prophet's death, she was leading an army. She was leading an army radiallahu anha. This was the beginning of civilization in Islam. This is what Islam really gave. Not what we've turned or what we've seen in our society uh, of, of women. They had, they had the right to have their own independent property. When a woman is married according to all fiqhs, especially according to the Hanafi fiqh, when a woman is married, she can say to her husband, I have the right to have an independent room or at least an, indi or an independent property. 
if the, if the husband cannot provide her with an independent property from, from his own parents, where the parents are living, then he has to at least provide her with an independent room where she has the right, if she wants to, to say that none of your family members will enter this room of mine without my permission. That's totally her right to be independent in that room. And a lot of ulama have stressed that she should have an independent right to have her own house so that she's, she's, you know, she can take her hijab off and so on. So she's, this is in, in Islam, and this was after the Prophet uh, he, he became a Prophet. They have the right to work, to earn their own money if they need or want it. Why this is? Because women in Islam don't really have to earn their own money. This is a significant difference in the in the uh, in evolution in our, in our history of how the whole laws have formed. Because before, before this, every woman had to work and do something for their husband. But the Prophet ﷺ changed this by giving their woman the right to stay at home and the, wo- and the man, in, according to Quran in chapter number 4, verse number 34, and in other, many other places, many other places, the Quran stresses on the man providing for his wife. He is the breadwinner. If she wants, she can stay home and she has a right not to earn. If she earns anything after that, and this is from the Sharia, and this is not from, this is something which might shock some of you, if she earns anything above that, she has the right to have her money for herself and her husband has no right to interfere with her money. This is the plain truth from the Sharia. If you look at any one of the fiqh books, you'll find that Islam has, is the first religion to give a woman the right to have her own property, to have the right to have her own earnings and to keep it for herself. Because the man, when he marries her, he's, he's agreeing to a contract. One of the basic rights that he will give to her is an nafaqa. Nafaqa means that he will spend on his wife. He will provide her with her clothes, with her food and with her shelter and will be all according to his status if he is, the Quran says عَلَى الْمُوسِرِ قَدَرُ وَعَلَى الْمُقْتِرِ قَدَرُ One who is rich according to his ability he will spend one who is poor according to his ability he will spend and that the woman should accept however her husband is in, in, that, in that right. The Quran has said that both of them are equal in reward. There's another thing in the Quran where it says, مِن ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى مَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِن ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى Many places of the Quran, about four or five places of the Quran. The Quran says that whoever does an action of good, whether it's a female or a male, now this, this is a move from what the Christians believe, because the Christians have believed that the woman is sinful because she is the one who, who ate the apple first from the tree in Jannah, and that, therefore she is sinful. And her sin is inherited and therefore she was punished. And because of her punishment she now bears a child. Because of her punishment she has a month, her monthly menses every, uh, every month. That was a punishment from God according to the Bible. But the Quran makes no mention. The Sunnah makes no mention of that. A woman is not punished through this. And a woman's duty is not just to bear children and to uh, look after the children and thereafter uh, to, to bear certain necessities that are over her. That is not what Islam says. A woman has the right to be uh, an individual in the society just as men. She has the right to participate fully in public life and have their voices heard by those in power. Now this was again another significant move and by late life Umar radiallahu anhu had changed because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi had, had displayed his sunnah in front of him. When Umar radiallahu anhu became a khalifa once he was on the mimba and he then told uh, men in the, in the khutbah, he said, don't, uh, your women, to the nearest meaning of that, your women do not have the right to have a mahar, to have uh, a bride gift that is very expensive and very dear for men to provide. And a woman in the khutbah stood up. Now some ulama say these are two different rewires. And some ulama say that this is one riwayah on its own. But nevertheless, the ulama are certain that a woman stood up in the, in the mosque, in khutbah, and she said, O Umar, how dare you say 
that women cannot have a, a, a mahr or a bright gift that is a dear. When Allah says in the Holy Quran, in chapter number 4, verse number 20, Allah says, وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمُ اسْتِبْدَالَ زَوْجٍ مَكَانَ زَوْجٍ If men, you decide to change one wife for another. وَآتَيْتُمْ إِحْدَاهُنَّ قِنْطَارًا And you have previously given a woman a whole hoard of gold, a heap of gold. فَلَا تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُ شَيْئًا Don't take it back from them. This is the advice from God. So she said to Umar رضي الله عنه, that if Allah has mentioned in the Qur'an, that men have provided a particular woman with even a hoard of gold, they shouldn't take it back. How do you then stipulate that a man should not you know, give, uh, give a mahar that is too dear for him? So Umar radiallahu anhu, there and then, in the Jummah khutbah, he took back what he said because of this woman. Now women hear their rights and their, vo- their voices were heard of even in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. They have the right to provisions from the husband for all their needs and much more. We'll come to that a little later. The right to negotiate marriage terms of her choice. Islam is the religion that gave women the right to say no to a marriage and to say yes to a marriage if they, if they will, at their desire. If there's no consent from a woman, there is really no valid nikah. Because uh, as I quoted to you last month, uh, Hansa radiallahu anha, according to hadith of Bukhari, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she said that my father has got me married to this man, uh, and I don't, I don't like this man. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is fakari hadalik faatat Rasul Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam faradda nikaha. When she said this to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then annulled her marriage, broke her marriage, just because her father got her married to this man and she didn't like the man. And this was another significant move that just because that she doesn't like her husband, she can actually, actually go to a judge of an Islamic court and say, just on the basis that she doesn't like her husband in early marriage, she can say that she does not want to stay with her husband. The right to obtain divorce from her husband, even on the grounds that she simply can't stand him, and so on. Now, Islam, before Islam was, here, was there, a woman had never had the right to ask for a divorce. In the Quran, the Quran has given a new law to mankind of khula. Khula means that the woman can ask for a separation. And if she wants, in certain cases, she can even state down in a marriage contract that she wants to have the right to divorce herself whenever. And if the husband does agree to that, then she has the right to divorce herself according to the conditions that are met in the marriage contract. Now, these, these are some of the things which women have, um, have... Now, in Islam, I just want to now go on to a few things where Islam is more or less attacked on certain grounds. And I just want to give you a few uh, references from the Qur'an and Sunnah so that you can defend uh, the Islamic position that we, we hold. In terms of polygamy, now this is a, one of the main places where non-Muslims of the West, West will point at Islam and say, how does your your religion allow a man to marry four women and not vice versa and basically it's not fair and it's not equality in rights. Polygamy is something which was in Europe right up to the mid-1800s. Even in Germany there's been polygamy and especially after the World War II women came out to the streets begging the government to allow men to marry more than once. Now polygamy is Basically, it's a hukm a shari'i. It's a divine law. And Allah has created human beings. He wouldn't make a law that, would be, that, would be not, that wouldn't be necessary just for the sake of it. That's not Allah. Allah knows human beings. He knows the future. He has foreknowledge of the future. Therefore, he, 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 he has polygamy in the laws of the Qur'an. But polygamy is not something which Allah has put as the azima. Now there's two principles in uh, Islam. One is azima and one is rukhsa. Azima is the real hukm, the real law. And rukhsa is something which then Allah gives you as a choice whether you want to do it or not. For instance, um, to wash one's feet while doing budu is azima. To do masah over uh, the khuf or the leather socks is rukhsa. You have a choice. 
whether you want. But azima, the best hukm is washing your feet and the most reward is given for washing the feet. The same applies when it comes to uh, nikah, when it comes to marriage. Azima, according to Quran in chapter number 4, verse number 3, Allah says that it is best because men might not be just to more than one wife. That it is best to stay with one wife. And no more than, not more than one wife. But Allah does give permission to have more than one wife. Allah certainly gives that permission in chapter number 4, verse number 3. It is not something which Allah urges men to do. Because Allah has placed so many conditions. And one of the main conditions is adl. To be absolutely fair to one wife and to the other. So if you were to buy one a gift, you have to buy a gift for the other. If you were to spend X amount of nights with one, you have to spend the same nights with the other and so on. There is no adl or justice in the love that is shared, that is shared but there definitely has to be adl or justice between the women in the way that they are treated. And this is very, very hard for, for men to do. Therefore, Allah has said, If you have the fear that you will not be able to be just with your wives, then only one. Now, Allah knew that there's going to be certain situations that, me, that women would uh, have to get married in their numbers to men. And that's why, for instance, after war, when there's a decline of men in the society, or for instance, when a woman is, is barren and the man has to live with that woman, or for, for many other... Um, but which I, don't, I don't really want to go into detail here, because um, the, the children listen to this. But... There are other reasons why Allah has allowed polygamy um, in, in the Qur'an. So there is certainly a necessity for this in certain times. Now, when Allah has given permission to, for, to, to man to marry more than one, this is under strict rules, and a man has to make sure that he meets the requirements of the wives, both of us. So he has to provide both of them with separate accommodations. He has to look after both. And it's a great responsibility. Now I know someone who has been married for several years with more than one wife. And I can see that it's, it's not easy for this person. It's, it's quite difficult. But at the same time what I want to say is that one of the reasons why Allah has given this, this, uh, this hukum is because in a traditional Islamic society the, ma- the woman doesn't really have to cook and clean. If she wants to, she can stay away from these basic necessities. Now, I need you ex- to give me some time for explanation. In a traditional society, the woman doesn't have to carry out these duties. It's her right to say, well, I don't want to clean, I don't want to cook. I don't. She even, according to the Quran, she has the right to say that I'm not even going to breastfeed the child and I want you to go and get another woman, pay her to breastfeed the child and this is in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is chapter number 2, verse number 233. That if she wants to, she can do that. But in Islamic history, this has hardly ever happened, where she's actually said to her husband that I'm not going to even breastfeed the child. But to this extent, you can see that Islam has given her the rights to, to go this far with the husband. But why it is given this right is because in a traditional society, Men, in traditional Islamic society, men in, in those cities, in, in those areas like Kufa, Basra and those Arabian uh, cities, they, they had maids. Some of them had slaves, slave girls. Okay? And even in the hadith you can see that men kept slave girls as well as their own wives. So they could actually sleep with their slave girls just as they, they slept with their own wives. And their slave girls or their maids would carry, carry out the work in the societies. And that's why you have polygamy as another reason. That men had the right to get married to more than one wife and that the second wife might, out of her, out of her moral duty, she might look after the husband's necessities while the first wife, or the, early, uh, the, the first, first wife, she might not want to do these things. So the man had a choice of getting married to more than one woman. There were many benefits. There's once, once, once a Habi came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I'm in poverty. So the Prophet ﷺ said, get married again. So then he got married again and he came back and said, yeah, Messenger of Allah, I'm still in poverty and I'm actually worse than I was before. So the Prophet ﷺ said, well, get married again. So he got married to a third one. And he came back and said, Messenger of Allah, 
it's worse now, worse than what it was with two wives. So the Prophet said, get married again. So then he got married again to a, to, to a fourth wife, and this fourth wife was one with intelligence, and she then uh, managed the entire house. She got the other three to work as well as herself. And then the man became prosperous, he became rich in a few days. He came back to the Prophet and said, well now it's worked. And he could see what the Prophet meant, that women can actually help. But the whole structure of those cities and those countries were different from what we have today. And we have to be clear about this, that the Qur'an has stated one thing. If you look at the entire Surah Baqarah, um, at the end, near to the end, around the verses 200 onwards, you will see that Allah has talked about men and women and how they should live and how they should be with one another and the rights of their children and so on. But you find that Allah again and again says Bil Ma'roof, Bil Ma'roof or Ma'roofan. He uses the word Ma'roof. And the word Ma'roof means conventionally. Or it means according to your customs. According to your, your uh, accepted ways in your society. And why Allah says this is very, very important is that the Qur'an though it was practiced by the Arabs in, the, in early Islam where they married more than one wife and they had maids and slaves Allah knew that this would not be the case after 1400 years now even in the Arab states it's difficult for Arab men now to get married to more than one wife because the whole uh, geo-domestic structure has changed domestic just, uh, social structure has changed now you've got more hurriya, you've got more freedom now it's not like the past where women actually stayed in their homes out of their own moral duty that they served their husband and so on. It's a moral duty. A woman is expected, she's expected that she should look after her husband. And especially in these societies where women are living with husbands, like they both are earning their living just to pay off for their mortgage, for their house and for the right to live and so on. If the woman turns in these societies and says to her husband, well I'm not going to cook, I'm not going to clean and I'm not going to do these basic duties for you, then the man will be obliged. The man will be obliged to look for an alternative. And it's going to, be a, it's going to turn into a crisis in these societies for, for them to say, well you can't get married to another woman, at the same time I'm not going to do your basic duties. It's not going to work. One or the other has to be compromised. Either the women have to say, well, I give you permission to get married to, to another wife who will look after all your necessities, or I will look after all your necessities uh, out of my moral duty, and I want you um, to stay with me uh, alone as, as, as a husband with one wife. So, the whole structure was different in those days, how, and how it is today, especially in Britain, it's totally different. And you can't apply rules that are in the Sharia for men who used to live in societies where there were plenty of slave girls to buy from the market. There were plenty of maids to hire in the society. And they all had more than one wife. Practically they all more or less had more than one wife. And that's how the whole structure was based. And for them to write fiqh according to how it's been written over a thousand years ago was totally understandable. But today you can't really apply everything of that fiqh to today's society. You have to have certain changes and these are the certain changes that, that I definitely see in, in the Sharia uh, for the people living in Britain and in the West that they, they want to stay uh, with w one husband and one wife they want to have that kind of life then go ahead but there has to be more moral duties that, that are given to the, the husband and so on now why Allah says one man and four, four women not one woman and four men is because practically it doesn't really work out it has been practiced before in India, in certain places of India and it's called polyandry but it really hasn't been able to progress because the woman is the one I mean, you can imagine when she, is, when she has a child to bear what the husbands will do and so on there's, there's so many difficulties that a woman faces uh, because of her, the way Allah has created her not that she's at fault for this but this is the way that Allah has created men and women uh, for instance her uh, once a month she will not be able to do, carry out the husband's rights and if she has more than one husband, you can imagine what will happen within her household, um, how she will be able to control the situation. It's absolutely more improbable for, for, this to, for this to take place. And that's why Allah has given the hukum, the law, one way and not the other. Inheritance. Another part is inheritance where non-Muslims um, take a jab at Muslims and say, well, why is it that the woman gets... A th if, the, if there's inheritance left, there's two boys, so there's one boy and two girls left 
There's three children. There's one of them who's just a boy and two of them girls. Then the inheritance that is divided is that two girls will take quarter and quarter and the, and the boy will take half of the wealth. Now the reason for this, and it's a simple answer, is that Islam says that the men have the right to look after the necessity of the entire family. They have to spend for the wives, they have to spend for the children. When a woman takes that quarter of the wealth, she doesn't have to spend a penny. She can say, well this is all my money, I don't have to spend a penny for the children. Morally she should, okay, but she doesn't really have to. She can't say that. But what I, what I think needs to happen in, in the West especially, where there is an understanding between men and women that they will look after one another and, they don't, and the woman doesn't want to have more than one wife in the house, morally she should combine her wealth with her husband and say, and this has been happening for a long time, and Sayyidina, uh, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had divided the duties amongst Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhuma. He told Ali to, become, to go out and, and to earn a living, to get to get the daily bread for, for the house. And he told Fatima radiallahu anha to look after the necessities of the house. Now one of the reasons why the Prophet did this is you will find a hadith in Ibn Majah where the Prophet did not want because Fatima radiallahu anha according to her nature she didn't want to have another she didn't want Ali radiallahu anha to have another uh, wife according to her nature. And the Prophet saw this. So therefore he changed certain laws for both of them where he said, well, Fatima, now you look after the household duties. And there were a lot of things which the Prophet expected Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhu to, to share. And why he did this, whereas his own life was different. Because he came home and he used to mend his own shoes. He used to look after, the, look after his own necessities in the house. He used to do this uh, out of his sunnah because he had more than one wife and so, and so on. It was different for Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima because... He made a statement that he didn't want to see his own daughter hurt by Ali radiallahu anhu marrying another woman. And then Ali radiallahu anhu, though he had the intention, he gave up his intention. And only after the, the death of Fatima radiallahu anha did, did he marry several women. But during, he, he, while he had Fatima radiallahu anha, he did not get married to more than one woman. But this was something which she, she wanted from her own nature. And the Prophet sallallahu emphasized that and he helped her to, to, to win that. Now, um, as I said about the inheritance, because the man's responsibility is to spend and the woman's responsibility is not, therefore Islam gives different shares to women than men. Another one is witnessing in courts. Now the Quran in Surah Baqarah states in, in uh, Surah Baqarah, which is the second chapter of the Holy Quran, verse number, this goes to, the, to one of the uh, longest verses, this is, this is actually the longest verse in the Quran where this is 282 verse number 282 the Quran says when it comes to witnessing in, in the court or for instance for a, for a transaction the Quran says you should have two witnesses to witness this from your men if there are not two men then then one man and two women from the witnesses which you are pleased with and because one woman might forget so the other one might remind her. Now, West, the West have picked on Islam on this point. Why is it that two <coughs> witnesses from women is equal to one witness of a man? Recently I came across an article, um, an article from a source, a scientific source, where a professor in German actually went about with a whole test on women and he found, and he, he did tests in the brain. I can't remember actually the professor's name but he did test and found that there is a chance, there's a 40% chance of women, 40% uh, less chance of women remembering things than men. In, in cases of incidents, in the way they will narrate. Okay? This is in particular not to do, this doesn't mean that women are less intelligent than men. In no way does it mean that. But it means that when women narrate a story or an incident that they actually witnessed with their own eyes, there's there's, he's, he's done tests on men and women and found that there is a chance, 40% chance, more than men that she, a particular woman, that this could mean it's, one, it's, it's every four women out of ten women. So it's not applying to women generally that she might actually f not remember a certain incident the way she's seen it and that another woman might have to remind her. And that's why the woman has stressed 
uh, that, that's why uh, the Quran has stressed that there should be two women to one man when it comes to these reasons. Another reason uh, is that the Quran doesn't want women to come forward and to deal in these cases. The Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to keep women away from these matters. Therefore, he has dis- discouraged women from coming to the courts and, and witnessing and so on. It's just like the masjid, where the Prophet Allah says, women are allowed to come to the mosques, but it's better for them to stay home. And there are several hadith for this. He's given the permission to come to the mosque, and he's even, even told men, don't stop you women from coming to the mosque. But at the same time, he has said that the best place for a woman, for her ibadah, for her worship, is her own house. So it's the same way, women can come to courts and they can witness, but it's more preferable that they stay away from these matters and let men deal with this because with crime in society, once you deal with this, there are more things that come about uh, as repercussions. Um, Another one I've I've discussed about the the education you might have seen recently in Afghanistan and so on, whatever was there and even in our countries where women are are still to this day deprived of education in Muslim countries. This is not Islamic, as I've said to you. Ibn Asakir, uh, who was a muhaddith of hadith, he had approximately a thousand teachers. He traveled from country to country, um, transmitting hadith and taking hadith from different teachers. Of them, 80 of them were women. 8-0, 8-0, 80 of them were women muhaddithas whom he took hadith of. Ibn Hajar Asqalani who is the commentator of Bukhari, he's got the most famous commentary on Bukhari which is known as Fatul Bari. Four of his teachers were women whom he took a lot of hadith from and he actually has them in his sanad, in his chain to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there were so many women muhaddithas, uh, women uh, um, transmitters of hadith and pass and, and uh, women who, who transmitted hadith and who took hadith from men and women in the, after the Prophet's life. So this is part of our whole law that women should be educated, but this is something which is cultural that is happening. Again, with, with women staying at home and not being let out and so on, Islam has said that a woman shouldn't leave the house, and I'll come to this in detail in, in a little while, without the permission of her, of her husband. She, should, she shouldn't leave the house without the permission of the husband. But the husband should not be so strict that he keeps her in the house. And this is clearly stated in the fiqh books. Okay, moving on from here, um, from the rights of women, um, just a couple more things I just want to mention before I move on. Is that, if you look in the Quran, a whole surah has been named by, by the name of women. Surah An-Nisa, the chapter number 4. You have in the Quran... Maryam alayha salam and her status you have in the Quran one significant thing which is that there is actually capital punishment for anyone who blames a woman and who accuses, accuses her of something, something which is blasphemous this is in chapter number uh, 24 verse number 4 Allah says وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْسَنَاتِ the men who accuse women who are chaste women who, who have got their dignity and they haven't done something wrong they accuse her of doing something illegal with other men and then they can't produce four witnesses then lash these men 80 times and never accept another witness from these men ever again and these men are sinners إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Except those men who repent and then they rectify what they've done, Allah is most forgiving. So here in the first time in the civilization of human history, do you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving a law directly in the Qur'an that if a woman is accused of something which is illegal in the society and men accuse her, what I mean is that, you know, the, the basic things with men and women, if men accuse and they're, they're unable to provide four, witness, four witnesses, then the men will be lashed. Even if they have three witnesses, even if they have four, but the fourth one backs away, then all three that remain there will, will be lashed, 80 times each. And this is a Quranic uh, hukum of Allah. So you can see how much status Allah has given to women, especially in Islam. The second thing I want to move on to is the hukuk al-zawjiyya, the rights of, of men and women 
Um, with regards to marriage, I'm not, go- I'm not going to go into the actual marriage contract or the guardian or the wali and the wedding festival and the mahar. These are specific details, maybe some other time we'll be able to discuss this. But the actual hukuk or the rights of men and women, um, Allah, Allah says in the Holy Quran. Now, one thing I, I have to mention here is that there are two specific eyes in the Quran. Shows two different sides between men and women. One ayah is Laysa Dhakarukal Umtha. A male is not the same as a female. That is one ayah of the Quran. This is in Surah Ali Imran, which is the third chapter of the Holy Quran, verse number 36. Another part of the Holy Quran is Surah Baqarah, which is chapter number 2. In verse number 228, Allah says, The rights that men have over women, in the same way, in the same likeness, women have rights over men. Bil ma'roof, conventionally. Bil ma'roof, meaning according to the accepted forms in your society, how it would be acceptable to have rights over one another. Walil rijali alayhinna daraja. But men have the upper hand over women. Okay? Now, I need to give a bit of detail of, of these two specific verses. The first ayah that I quoted to you of that men are not the same as women, you can see this in the role, roles that they have in life. The West has gone so far after this feminist movement that has given women all the rights exactly equal to men. That women now can divorce men, men can divorce women as they and when they wish. Women have the status to have, to have any job in any part of the structure, the social, social structure. And, and it's gone to that extent where you now have women as bank managers, women and you know, there's nothing wrong with this. But what is significantly wrong is that you can't have two kings in one country. You'll always have corruption if you have two kings or two people in power in one country. The same way in one house, if you have two people in charge, you, you'll have a conflict. You will never get to a decision. You'll, you'll always end up in a divorce. And the reason why Allah has given men the right to, to, um, to have the divorce in their hands initially is because men, according to psychological studies in America, and this is from reliable sources, that men in most cases will have control over their emotions than women. Women are emotional. Allah has created, created, created them for this reason. And I'll give you an example. In their roles of life, you won't see... You know, I, I met some Muslims from Bradford. These are my own colleagues from, from Bradford who we studied together. Yeah, after that they graduated, they opened a, a nursery in Bradford and uh, they tried to run a nursery. These were, these were middle-aged men who tried, to, who tried to run a nursery for a few years. After one and a half years, they had to give the nursery up. And they, they were frustrated. They couldn't run the nursery. So they turned to other ulama in the society and the other ulama told them that, look, give it up and give it to the women because they're the best to, to run the nursery. So they gave, it, gave the nursery to the women to control and Alhamdulillah it's been running fine since then. And if you look at most nurseries, why women are the most, uh, you know, they, they are accepted in this, in this area of, of work is because they are more compassionate and they are the best for that duty. And they will do a better job than men in that duty because they have more raham in their hearts, they have more justice and uh, more compassion in their hearts for children. Are, the children can drive them crazy all day and they will still be forgiven. Whereas men, You'll see their blood boiling after a little while if they, have to be, uh, if they have to stay in their kindergarten all day. But on the other hand, if you look, most uh, manual, heavy duty manual work that is done in our societies, for instance, digging up roads and so on, is done by men. You don't see a group of women going with kangos in their hands and drilling into, into uh, hard ground. Because that's not their nature. Men are more muscular than women in most cases. And Allah has created them different in the sense that in the roles of life, they will be different. In certain things men are better, certain things women are better. But in this second ayah, Allah has given them both rights. And when Allah says, man, men have rights over women, women have rights over men, you have to look at this as a scale. You can't have more rights on one side and other rights on the other. You will, find, you will see in Islamic Sharia, Allah has given rights to both sides. Like for instance, like the things I've mentioned earlier, the woman doesn't have to cook clean and you know, she has their own money. At the same time, the man has certain rights. He has a right that he, he will, you know, the woman should obey her. Obedience is given in the, in the hands of man, that a woman should obey him. And someone has to have the control. You can't have two people in a house. That's why in this society, 
every one marriage in three marriages and it ends up in a divorce. The minimum in this, in this society is 33% of, of uh, marriages end up in divorce. Why? Because they have total hurriya, total freedom. You can't have this in, in a household. There has to be someone in authority and Allah has given men the authority. Not that the men should abuse their authority. This is another issue on its own. But men have initially been given the authority. Now, just to mention a few things, what the woman gets and what the man gets. The woman has a right to have her bride gift or a mahar. That the man should give her a gift in return of her giving up herself in the contract of marriage. And this is... Um, the, the woman also has the right that the man should spend on her. And this is another whole part of Sharia, how the man should spend, on what terms the man should spend. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. We'll just basically, I'll quote to you one hadith. A man came to the Prophet wasallam and he said, مَا حَقُّ الْمَرْأَةِ عَلَى الزوج? He said, what right does a woman have over a man? The Prophet wasallam said, and تُطْعِمَهَا إِذَا طَعِمْتَ That you should feed her when you eat yourself. وَتَكْسُوهَا إِذَا اكْتَسَيْتَ that you should clothe her when you, when you buy clothes for yourself. وَلَا تَضْرِبِ الْوَجْهَ You should never strike her on her face. وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ You should never use abusive uh, language or you should never put her down or say something like قَبَّحُ الله, That may Allah disgrace you or certain words. وَلَا تَهْجُرْ إِلَّا فِي البيت. If he ever comes to the stage that you have to discipline her then, uh, and remove your bedside from her to discipline and I'll come to, to that in a bit. But make sure that it's always in the house and not outside the house. And this is a Sahih Hadith of Bukhari or Muslim. I'm not quite sure which one. There's, the woman has the right that her husband should remain with, with her in good companionship. And this is, um, this is from several ayahs from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu You can see how he remained with his wife, with his wives. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has even stated, uh, so sorry, Abbas of the, Ibn Abbas of the Allah, he has stated this is an athar from him. He says, إِنِّي لَأُحِبُّ أَنْ أَتَزَيَّنْ لِلْمَرْأَةَ كَمَا أُحِبُّ أَنْ تَتَزَيَّنَ لِي He said, I prefer that I should dress up nicely and come in a good uh, appearance, appear in a good appearance in front of my, my wife, just as I expect her to come in front of me, meaning with perfume and good clothes and so on. So he, he actually, from this ayah, his, his tafsir of this ayah was that he would dress up properly, he would look after his hair, he would, he would apply perfume to his body, just for his wife, just as he accepted his own wife to do the same. They, she has the right that he, the husband should remain with, in a good manner with her throughout the, throughout the staying together. And this is from several ahadiths. I'm just going to quote you a few ahadiths from the Prophet from Sunnah. The Prophet said, Inna lakum min nisa'ikum haqqa wa li nisa'ikum alaykum haqqa. That your women have rights over you, just as you have rights over your women. فَأَمَّا حَقُّكُمْ عَلَى نِسَائِكُمْ As for the rights which you have over your women, فَلَا, فلا يُؤْطِيَنَّ فُرُشَكُمْ مَنْ تَكْرَهُونَ They should not let anyone even sit on your bedsides whom you do not want or who you detest. Basically meaning other men and so on. وَلَا يَأْذَنَّ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ لِمَنْ تَكْرَهُونَ They should not even allow anyone to enter your house whom you do not want. Ala wa haqquhunna alaykum, but your right, their rights over you is that an tuhsinu ilayhinna fi kiswatihinna wa ta'wa wa ta'amihinna, that you should be good to them in terms of how you, you, you buy clothes for them and, and you feed them as well. This is a sahih hadith in Tirmidhi. Another hadith is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again in Tirmidhi from Aisha radiallahu anha, he says, Khairukum khairukum li ahli. The best of you is the best to women. Wa ana khairukum li ahli, and I'm the best to my, to my own family. The word he actually uses is family, not women. But in another hadith he says, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا وَخِيَالُكُمْ خِيَالُكُمْ لِسْمِسَائِهِمْ Both of these hadiths are from Tizmidhi. The Prophet that the, says that the believers of the utmost degree, the, the highest degree of belief that a mu'min and a believer can have is when he has the best characteristics, when he has the best character for others. وَخِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ And the best of you are the best who are to their, to their own women, to their wives. Um, she also has the right that the, the man should sleep with her and this is a basic necessity of, of marriage. Once Umar radiallahu anhu, now look at the rights again of women uh, provided by the Islamic Sharia. Once Umar radiallahu anhu, he passed by a house, I mean in the night times he would go around the streets and just to see that things are okay in the society. He passed by this particular house and from this house he heard a poem and, and the woman 
during his reign was saying this poem, poem she said Tatawala um, هذا الليل uh, that this night has become very long waswadda jawanibu and and the the ends of this night are darker than anything else um, she she said that why her, her words were that laula khalilun ulaibu that i haven't this night is so long and so dark because i don't have anyone besides me to play with meaning a, a friend of hers laula khashiyatullahi wal haya if it wasn't for wallahi laula khashiyatullahi wal haya she said by allah if it wasn't for the fear of allah in my heart and for for the shame and embarrassment that i would suffer la hurrika min hadha salil jawanibu then from the side this whole bed would shake with 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 another man now she made this poem and umar radiyallahu marked her house he then went straight away the next day to his own daughter hassa and he said oh hassa I've, I've, he said, what is the longest period that a woman can stay away from her husband? And she said, you, the likeness of you is asking his own daughter is such a question. And he said, if it wasn't for this incident, I wouldn't have asked you. So she said, five to six months, she, she gave a rough idea. So then Umar radiallahu anhu, after consulting others as well, he made, it, he made a new law that no mujahid or no person going into jihad, jihad should spend more than six months. One month for going out, one month for coming back, and four months for staying in jihad. The, the maximum period he, he stated down was six months, and that he should come back to, the, to his own wife, because she has a right to see him. So this is an, again another uh, place where men who leave their wives for a long time and go for business abroad, they should take this in consideration, that a woman is a human being at the end of the day. And a man doesn't, I mean, she can give her right away and say, okay, I, I will allow you to go for a whole year abroad and to earn money. She can do that. But it's not the best thing for, for a man and for his wife to do this, that they stay apart from one another for a long period of time. Um, to go to now, to, to the rights that men have over women, Allah has, the first thing the Prophet ﷺ has stated down is that men have, men, uh, women should... Uh, be obedient to their to their husbands. The Prophet ﷺ has stated in the Hadith of Tirmidhi, "لو كنت أمرا أحدا أن يسجد لأحد لأمرت المرأة أن يسجد ل ل لزوجها أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام." The Hadith of Tirmidhi. The Prophet ﷺ says, "If I gave permission to anyone to uh, marry, uh, sorry, if, if I gave permission to anyone to do sajda or to bow down to anyone else, then I would have given permission to for a woman to bow down to her husband." Another hadith the Prophet says, Ayyum amra'atin matat wa zawjuha anha radin dakhlat al jannah. Hadith again of Tirmidhi. Any woman who dies and her husband is pleased with her, then she will enter paradise straight away. Another hadith the Prophet says, Ida da'a rajuli imratahu ila firashi. When a man calls his wife to come to his side, uh, to his bedside, then she should come if she disobeys. Fa'in abat. If she disobeys, لعنت الملائكة, then the angels will curse her until the morning. Now this hadith again is, is his right that she should come to his, to his side. But a husband should not really go to the extent that he uses these ahadiths just to enslave her in the house. A woman shouldn't, just as a woman is expected that she shouldn't say, well my money is my money, you, know, you get your own money wherever you were given. Just as it's a moral duty again, that she should spend from her own money and they should share their wealth. Again, from the husband's side, if he wants to, he can be strict. And he can say, well, you can't go out of the house. And the only place uh, she can actually go without his permission then is to her own parents if they become sick. If they become ill, the Hanafi Madhab says that the only uh, time she can leave the house without permission is then. But the husband shouldn't be that strict. He should let her, you know, freedom is something which people, you know, a husband should apply to his wife and a wife should apply to the husband. And they both should base their own uh, marriage on trust between themselves. And not to um, be harsh on one another. Once you see either a man becomes harsh with his uh, wife, or a wife becomes harsh with her husband, in any terms, that's when you see things breaking up. It normally starts from one or for the, uh, with the other. If it does start, I will come to that in a bit of what, what should, should take place. The wife also, when she leaves the house, she should cover herself. The wife, when she leaves the house, the Prophet ﷺ has said, according to hadith of Hakim from Musa uh, radiallahu anhu, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ay ayyum amra'atin ista'tarat, fakharajat fa'marat ala qawmin liyajidu rihaha fahiya zaniya." A woman who leaves her house and she has applied perfume to her body, so that other men might 
might um, smell this perfume and find her fragrance, then she is a zana, she is an adulterer if she does this. Meaning that obviously she will be calling to adultery if she does it. So her perfume even should be applied to herself. Or her zina, her basic ornaments and things like that should be displayed for her husband only. And not for other men. And this is a beautiful system in Islam. Where, you know, in Islam you don't even have any contact with the man, any contact with the man and the woman. Who are not married to one another, who are not mahram to one another. It's a beautiful thing because the woman is preserved in Islam. The woman is definitely preserved. I remember one of my teachers telling me once, that he came across this Christian who said to him, look at your women, you keep them in their homes, you don't let them come out, they have to cook and clean for you, when they come out they have to cover themselves, look how horrible this is, look at our women, they, they have freedom to go out. And my, my teacher, he said to uh, this, this Christian, he said, you know there's a difference between your women and our women. There's a slight difference. He said, what's the difference? He said, you know the difference between stones, you have a normal stone, and you have a precious stone. The one that is a normal stone found on the streets. You don't mind if it drops on the, on the road. You don't mind if it's in the rain. You don't mind if someone comes and kicks that stone to this wall and kicks it to the, to the roadside. But you know when you have a precious stone, you preserve it, you put it in a safe, you look after it. You don't want anyone to touch it other than your own permission. You be very careful in, in how you deal with that precious stone. He said, that's the difference between your women and our women. Your women, you've given them so many rights that they've turned into stones on the roads. You know, one man comes here and he kicks her one, the other one comes and does whatever he wants from another side and you got no, no, uh, you know, haya, so no modesty inside you. Whereas our women, we preserve them. This is the whole thing of, of Islam. When, when a woman gets married, she's known in the Quran as muhsana. She's known as one who's now chaste. She's got chastity and she's shown her chastity through her marriage. And that she wears her veil to show uh, men in the society that, look, I'm not a normal woman in the society. Traditionally, in Islam, you had, um, you had slave girls and you had ahrara, you had uh, um, women who were free. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he prevented the slave girls in the society to wear the hijab. Because, just, just to show the distinction between the, the women in the society, I mean, this was something which is in his, obviously in his own society, which he could do, there's not much fitna and so on. But he even prevented him from doing that, whereas the he, he told the women, and obviously women had to wear their hijabs, who were free women in the society. So my teacher gave this answer and said, look, this is the difference between our women and your women. And you see the case where these women who go out, who dress how they want, who wear perfume, uh, you know, and, and they, they go to places without their husband's permission, you find that in this society, what, what, what happens? I mean, with a lot of Muslim families now, it's really sad. A lot of Muslim families who, who have adopted the Western lifestyle, is that the woman has a boyfriend besides her husband and the husband they, they have plenty of girlfriends besides their own wife and what happens after that? You have uh, marriage breakings, you have divorces, you have arguments, you have beating of women and so on. All of this uh, crime, you have rape in the society, all of these crimes are a result, direct result of not following the divine laws. The divine law is, is simple. You, Allah has created nature in man for a woman, that he has a desire for a woman. Allah has created within a woman a desire for men. That's fine. He has created that. But then there should be maharim in between. There should be relatives who come in between when they get together. When they do get together, they create a boundary outside themselves. It's like a trust. When a man gets together with a woman and a woman with a man, it's like a trust. Like both of us now have entered this boundary now that I will never see another woman besides you in, in the wrong way and you will do the same for me that you will look after my, my own desires and wants and necessities. And this was a mutual understanding between them and always has remained. And wherever you have this adopted Islamically in, in societies and in families, Alhamdulillah, there is a lot of goodness that comes out. Look at our history. We are proud of our history as Muslims that we haven't got the same amount of rapes, the same amount of, of crimes as in their society. And we should point that to these things first. Um, if, if we ever come to that, that situation. Okay, another thing which, which the man has a right over the woman is that amana, that she should, she should uh, look after his wealth and his belongings and his children, should nurture them correctly uh, in his absence. And nurturing children is a shared, it's a shared responsibility between husband and wife. It's not just the wife's duty to do this. And um, inshallah we'll come to this in the next lecture. Another part and, and a significant ayah that I have to mention, which is the first ayah that I read, to you in the beginning of the uh, actual lecture is uh, uh, chapter number 4, verse number 34 that Allah has made the men uh, He has made them 
people who preserve their women بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضِ Because of certain uh, preference that Allah has given man over, over women وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And because of the, the, the wealth that they spend over the women فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِذَةٌ حَافِظَةٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ those women that are righteous, they are obedient, they, they look after their husbands' rights behind their backs. These are the women whom Allah praises in the Quran. But then Allah says, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ If you have women whom you fear that they are doing nushuz, now nushuz means that they are deliberately or they are becoming, you know, they are going beyond the boundaries, that they are either using abusive language or they don't want to come near your side when you call them to your side and so on. Okay, there's, there's a lot of tafsir in this nushuz. But if you fear this, then there are four stages. First stage is fa'iduhunna. Give them advice. Continue to give them advice. Second stage is, if after the advice, obviously they don't listen. And advice is not just once, it's plenty of times. And every case is different. Please remember this. Every marriage case is different. Every individual or two individuals are different. To what extent you have to go to advise your, your wife, this is left to you to decide. And the best thing to do is to take, if you are not sure, then take advice from a person who is hadiq, a person who has got, who understands a lot about, you know, uh, personalities and so on, to actually take advice from them, especially an imam or someone. وَهَجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِ After this, if they do not um, listen to you and if, that, if they do not obey you then the second stage is that you should separate your bedsides from theirs this is just to show, again, it's to show that you're upset with them, not to hit them not to do anything, not to swear at them not to jerk, not to abuse them or anything, the Quran says just separate your bedsides showing that you're not pleased with them and if this still doesn't work, then the third stage Allah uses the word darb now in a lot of translations, the word darb has been translated as hitting. That you may hit your wives. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was in Medina, men, as I said to you in the beginning, they used to beat their wives, they used to lash their wives. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to put a total end to this. And this is one of the reasons why Aisha radiallahu anha says, if you look at his own sunnah, you'll see that he's never ever hit a woman in his life. She says, according to Hadith al Nasai, she says, "Ma darba Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam imraatan lah." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has never, never hit a wife of his, or a woman. Wala khadiman, never a slave he has hit or a servant. Wala darba biyadhi shay, and he's never even striked his hand at anything ever in his life. Illa fi sabiillah, except in the path of Allah when he would go in jihad. Aw tanta kiha maharimullah. Or if the laws of Allah were disregarded and the Prophet ﷺ had to take revenge on behalf of Allah, that's when the Prophet ﷺ would lift his hand. Otherwise, he never lifted his hand. The Prophet ﷺ in Medina gave a different way of treating women. He said to them, he encouraged them again and again. He said, The best of you will never hit. And all the other hadith that I quoted to you before about how men should, should treat their, their wives. The Prophet ﷺ gave a very pure life. How men, he wanted to change the way they treated their wives. He wanted to change the whole structure. So again and again he would, he would try and reconcile or he would come in between and tell men how they should treat. To the extent that he said, I mean they used to beat their wives, leave bruises and so on before they were Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ said, he, gave, he, he restricted them one, one thing after another. First thing he said, وَلَا تَضْرِبِ الْوَجْ You can never hit the face. Another hadith of Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ said, غَيْرَ مُبَرَّحِينَ It should not be a hitting that would leave any mark or bruise behind. Another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, غَيْرَ مُخَوِّفٍ um, You should not use a kind of hitting that you would scare your wives, not even to scare them. The Prophet ﷺ in another hadith, he says, فَإِنْ كَانَ لَا بُدَّ مِنْ If you really have to hit them, then you, you, you will use a siwak. Miswak, which is the size of, size of a toothbrush. I mean, it'd be ridiculous for a man to pick up a toothbrush, okay, or the size of a some that size of a toothbrush, and to beat his wife with a toothbrush. Can you imagine seeing a man who trying to use a toothbrush, trying to beat his wife, and the Prophet will try to put them off? That this is not the way of civilization. This is not the way to go on. So then, what does this word here, what ribuhunna, mean? If you look in the Arabic dictionary, you will find that the word darb has more. He has it has up to eighteen meanings. Here it means that you should get tough with them. In whatever way, you should get tough with them. In your anger, the main thing is anger. Where the Prophet ﷺ would be so, we were so upset once, I quoted to you a few months back, that he left his wives 
for a whole month. Up to a whole month. He didn't, he didn't have any contact with them. He didn't talk to them for one month. This was his form of separating his bedside and showing God, meaning he took it to an extent where now he's getting very serious. He never lifted his hand, he never said a word to them that would hurt their feelings, but he showed absolute disapproval of what they were doing through this. And if you look in the Arabic dictionary, you will find these meanings fit exactly. He said, now, there's a significant part of this ayah, which I have to say to you is, the Quran says, فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا that if they start to obey you, then you have no way of rebuking them or to go back and dig in the past and say, remember you? Like once they've obeyed you and they're back, you're back to normal. Don't start picking a bone of something that's happened in history. Don't say, I remember this, you did this in the past, and now again you started to disobey me. The Quran has put a total stop to this. Because if, you, if you cut up uh, wounds of the past, then you will cause... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, you'll cause a great crisis in, in your own household then after this Allah says that if you still can't get together then there's the, the level of diplomacy meaning that if you still fear that they can't stay together and there's going to be separation between the two then then call a diplomat from his side of the family and a diplomat from her side of the family or it doesn't have to be from the family it can be from outside that two diplomats should get together and these two should be well aware of the situation should be good at ca- uh, reconciling and they should get together and try and bring them together if after that they can't bring them together then Allah says that they have to look for a last, last resort which is abghatul halal indallah at talaq that the, the most hated of lawful things in the sight of Allah is, is uh, talaq which is, which is a divorce, the most hated thing of lawful things. Um, just to quote to you one hadith, um, just before I, I end, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in chapter number 4, فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُهُنَّ فَعَسَانْ تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجَعَ اللَّهِ فِي خَيْرٍ كَثِيرًا That if you dislike something of your women, of a certain characteristic that they have, then maybe you dislike one thing, but Allah will put a lot of plenty of good in other things. The hadith to support that, the Prophet sallallahu says, that if there, if there is uh, something which you dislike of, of a woman in radiya minha khulu, uh, in, in kariya minha khuluq and radiya minha akhar if you, like, if you dislike something, there's something else you, you like so look at the positive side of women and move on from there now, here we end the talk with regards to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi showing disapproval of Ali radiallahu anhu marrying another woman while he was married to Fatima. Some ulama point to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did mention that the reason why he disapproved this fact was because Ali radiallahu anhu proposed to a daughter of one of the leaders of Makkah who was an enemy of Allah and because it would affect the Prophet ﷺ within Medina and the Prophet ﷺ would have to have a relation with one of these enemies of Allah. Therefore, he expressed his disapproval in a statement of his that his daughter and a daughter of a kafir would not come together in one household. Jazakumullah.